Uh, I would like to welcome you to the 2016 Founders Day Lecture. My name is Dr. Bill Strait. I'm one of the chairmen of the CME Founders Day program this year, and I have the honor of introducing our speaker for this um, uh, Founders Day talk today. I want to first start with why we're doing this, what this is all about, and I want to talk about the history of the Teening Founders Day Osteopathy Lecture. Um, in 2009, Fred C. Tinning, Ph.D., and his wife Janet created an endowment at A.T. Steele University, Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine, that will provide this <coughs> annual lecture on, on osteopathy during Founders Day. Dr. and Mrs. Tinning established the Fred C. Tinning, Ph.D., President Emeritus Founders Day Osteopathy Lecture Endowment because of their strong belief in perpetuating the importance of osteopathic principles and practices. Dr. Tinning was the eighth president of ATSU, serving in that capacity from 1984 to 1996. So he was the president when I was a student here, actually. Well. This year, we are honored to have Michael, Do Michael D. Lockwood, DO, FCA 81, pre present the 2016 Fred C. Tinning, PhD, Founders Day Osteopathy Lecture. His title, as you see, is Who Among You Will Change the World? Dr. Lockwood is a 1981 graduate of A.T. Steele University, Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine, right here. He and his wife, Kathy, have four daughters and five grandchildren. With 32 years of dedication to the osteopathic profession as a physician, professor, and administrator of ATSU, KCLM, and local Kirksville hospitals, Dr. Lockwood has enriched the lives of thousands of patients, colleagues, and students. Academically, Dr. Lockwood began his undergraduate studies in engineering, but soon shifted focus to his, his interest in biological sciences. In 1977, he received a Bachelor's of Science and Master's of Science in Biological Sciences and Immunology from California State Polytechnic University in Pomona. Dr. Lockwood attended ATSU and his Doctor of Osteopathic Medic Med Medicine degree. Following an internship at Kirksville Osteopathic Hospital, here, he stayed in the community as a staff physician and family practice doctor. Dr. Lockwood served as chief of staff in local hospitals. He served as chair of the ATSU KCM Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine Department here. He did this for nine years and also as chief of women's health while on faculty here at ATSU KCM. Dr. Lockwood has taught many courses in Kirksville on osteopathic theory and methods, but he was most interested in obstetrics and OMM. As a matter of fact, he's probably delivered much of the population here in Kirksville. <laughs> After 32 years of dedication to the osteopathic profession as a physician, professor, and administrator, Dr. Lockwood left the Kirksville community, relocating to Lynchburg, Virginia, to join the newest College of Osteopathic Medicine at the largest Christian university in the world, the newly found Liberty University College of Osteopathic Medicine, as a professor in the department of OMM. I want to mention also he's done a number of uh, medical mission trips as well. Dr. Lockwood is a board certified in family practice and OMM and is a fellow of the Cranial Academy. He's a past president of the Professional Foundation, the Osteopathic Cranial Academy Foundation. Personally, Dr. Lockwood was one of my teachers when I was a student here. He was one of my mentors when I was a res resident here, one of my partners when I joined the staff here, one of my bosses when he became chairman here. <laughs> I am proud to call him a great friend. Please give a Kirksville hearty welcome to Dr. Michael Lockwood. Thank you. Can we turn a few of these lights down a little bit so you can see the pretty colors on the, on the screen just a little bit better? Well, welcome everybody. I'm glad you're attending here this Ting Founders Day Osteopathy Lecture. This is kind of my uh, second home. I was here for 32 years. Now that's probably a little bit longer than some of you are alive. But that's 32 years we're here. And the, the title today, uh, we're going to talk about who's going to change the world. This is our, our newest, I don't think it's the newest now, it's the newest College of Osteopathic Medicine when I arrived there. It sits up on one of the seven hills surrounding Lynchburg, Virginia, looking over the Blue Ridge Mountains. We were quite amazed how flat things were when we kind of drove back in here because everything is curvy and twisty and up and down in Lynchburg. So here's our inaugural class of 162, and we can boast a stunning pass rate for part one boards, 90.5%, which is really pretty fantastic. Um, as far as disclosure information, I have no investigational drugs or investigational devices to disclose. Um, I don't get any uh, big 
uh, funding for this, but uh, basically it's a non-disclosure of my disclosure. Here is a few references for some of the uh, items we're talking about today for people who want to look in just a little bit deeper. Uh, the idea behind this whole talk is to try and determine uh, who among you is going to change the world. Here's a few learning objectives, basically a little bit more familiarity with A.T. Still and the genius that he was. A little bit in terms of the five models of osteopathic care, which pull things together into a mindset as far as application in the patient care arena, which is really what we're all about. And the third thing, we want to do a little bit of self-examination to, to determine you know, what are we all about as an individual in terms of our resume, our CV, and how do we compare that to our uh, reputation and our uh, outcomes as far as uh, the, our, our lifetime legacy, if you will. So who in the room here is going to be a, a, a world changer? I think you're all in the wrong spot there if you don't think you're going to be a world changer. <laughs> Everybody in the first year and second year class needs to be a, wor uh, a, a world changer. Some of the people up in the front here perhaps are already world changers. There's probably some of you in the, uh, with the white coats on who are all, already world changers. But the point is we are in a position where we're with our, our arena in patient care we are able to change, uh, change the world. Uh, we will talk a little bit about two individuals for perspective. Does anybody know Alfred Nobel? Probably called Nobel. Anybody know, what's, he, what's, his, what's his legacy right now? That's, yes, that was, his, that was his, one of his achievements. He created dynamite, but his actual legacy, he is now not known as a merchant of death. He is now known as a person who promotes world, the World Peace Prize and uh, prizes in literature and that type of thing. So the difference between his achievements and his legacy is something we want to focus on. How many people have read their own obituary so far? Well, he did. 1988, or excuse me, 1888, his brother Ludwig died, and for some journalistic goof, somehow his name got in print and he became reading his own obituary. Can you imagine that? Saturday morning, Sunday morning paper, and here you are. And what do they talk? To you? What do they say about you? You're a merchant of death. Uh, and other things that they said about him, he's a man who made it possible to kill more individuals in the world than anybody else in history. And then they said, you are just terrible because you made millions and millions of dollars while you did this. So he looked at that and he decided that he was going to change his legacy. And I'm glad he did. How about this fellow? Anybody know him? Do I know what that is? Is that familiar to anybody? That's called an osteogram. An osteogram. This was uh, drawn by one of his brightest students, a brilliant student, uh, Charlotte Weaver. And basically, it's kind of an outline of Andrew Taylor Still. And I'm here to say at today, at this hour, 142 years ago, four months, seven days, five hours ago, he began a movement that changed the world as well. So here is A.T. Still coming in there. You can see our fades in there, so that was the osteogram that they, that they drew. So who was this person in terms of his achievements? Most of his achievements are here on the side. Uh, certainly has a lot larger resume in terms of depth than I do and probably most people in this room. How many people have been inventors and machinists and state legislatures and uh, soldiers and patriots and, and de facto surgeons? I'm told that his surgical kit is at the Smithsonian right now, uh, so he did actually serve in the Civil War as a Civil War <laughs> Uh, surgeon. Uh, he was also very much in favor of uh, freedom. He was an abolitionist, a feminist, if you will. In other words, promoting uh, women. If you look at the first class, how many women were in his very first class? And how many were in other schools across the country? Probably zero. There's probably zero other women in, an, in any class of any medical school uh, in the United States at that time. So he is very much a person who uh, saw uh, opportunities uh, should be available basically to everybody. One of the things that was very interesting, he was declared one of the most significant complexity thinkers in the last hundred years. Now, who did that? Uh, the, who, the person who did that and uh, made that proclamation uh, was actually uh, R.C. Uh, Davis, who was at the Pikeville College of Osteopathic Medicine at, when it started. Here's a little bit more about Andrew, if you will. Uh, he was a person, as this complexity thinker, he pulled things together that we're just verifying today. Back in his day, did we know anything about axoplasmic flow? No. In fact, the nerves are necessary to nourish, not just the electrical activity, nourish tissues at the other end, and he decided that. Was he a person who believed in outcome medicine? Anybody read the signs up in the OMM lab there? What's that one up there? 
Talk is talk, but the biscuit speaks for the cook, which means you have to go beyond theory in terms of reality, in terms of outcome. So he was an outcomes-based type of uh, medical type of person uh, as well. Uh, he did this with, again, this uh, uh, incredible ability that really exceeded his personal ability. He had tasks in front of him that you really couldn't do in and of yourself, but he relied on his understanding of the laws of nature and God, uh, and basically as the God is the architect, and he believed that this is the basis for uh, a new type of medical care that he called osteopathic uh, medicine. He was a great communicator, and R.C. Davis was actually a linguist by training at the Pikeville College, and he analyzed everything he could find in terms of uh, Andrew Taylor Still. How did he come up with this stuff, and what, how did he, how did, how did, what's this phraseology about? And when he looked at that, he found there was a lot of information that was pertinent to the machine age. This was the Industrial Revolution. This is when they started making things in mass production, new methods of making steel and, and uh, products there that hadn't been done before. A revolution in agriculture. So now we have uh, more food to feed the population. Uh, tremendous changes in agriculture. Uh, it, bear in mind that he had been through areas, eras where there had been massive uh, global plagues. So there's a biological construct in his mind behind this as well. He also looked at things in terms of Newtonian physics. Uh, this was relatively new at the time. And Newtonian physics has three laws that basically says the laws of, the, of forces that govern motion and then what happens to that body in terms of those results of motion. So he looked at things from the standpoint of the Newtonian physics. Uh, he was also uh, followed in the footsteps of his father. His father was a preacher uh, and a physician, and he was the same. Uh, he was, uh, spoke in this language of evangelical Christianity, and uh, basically with that, you're trying to say that the essence of that belief is the gospel consisting of the doctrine of salvation by grace uh, through faith in Jesus Christ's atonement. And that's where he kind of came from. So that's kind of the uh, picture you get as far as a man. This, a lot of this was out of personal tragedy. Everybody remember his personal tragedies? He lost one wife and six children, six children out of 12. Uh, and that kind of uh, basically propelled him into this idea of study and discounting the medicine of the day, which is bloodletting, which is things like pukes and purgatives, opiates, those types of things that we call irrational medication or medicines, and those things that are actually detrimental uh, to the human body. So with that in mind then, keep these two in mind a little bit, but more important, think about yourself in this equation, personalize it. Both men achieved much, if you will. Both men had a legacy, and then the question is what will you have done, and what will be your legacy as you go forward? We have the fortune to have osteopathic medicine in terms of a patient-centered medical care kind of codified in these five arenas. Now, Anybody in this audience who does not think that there's a lot of overlap between these needs to look at them again because sometimes you can't put them in one box necessarily because it is so interrelated. His basic thesis was uh, parts of the body are interrelated, structure and function are interrelated, and, but this is a very convenient way to kind of look at things, if you will, in terms of an approach to patient care. And to the extent one of these or two of these or three of these arenas dominate in the patient care setting that you're in, then that would be with a place where you'd focus your attention and your therapeutic exercises. All right, so we have the biomechanical arena, the respiratory, circulatory, immune. These two are probably my two favorite. Oh, that's a really big, good one too. I kind of like that one too. Uh, this one, I came from a background in immunology back when they, how much did we know about uh, T and B cells back in, in uh, 1970s? Anybody know? We knew how to spell them and that's about it. Uh, it took the AIDS epidemic to transform that type of information into something meaningful. No one had a clue what reverse transcriptase was all about way back then. But these are the things that kind of in the back of my mind, as I'm looking at things in terms of patient care and patient care models, how do we put this together? And it's your job as physician, future physicians is to kind of pull this together in some sort of meaningful uh, package and not ignoring one part of the entire person that you're seeing at the time. So we call this a Stillian paradigm, if you will. It's been acclaimed by the World Health Organization as a very strong contribution to medical care in general. And for now, we're going to look at, just briefly, just a little tip of the iceberg on a few of these uh, systems. Biomechanics, remember I came from an engineering background, so a lot of this stuff makes sense in terms of structure and function to me. But here, with the uh, biomechanical world, if you will, then think about this world that the patient has where you're dealing with such things as classic biomechanics, uh, forces, fascial continuity, 
And then there's microsystems out there which get pretty intricate but very interesting, mechanical transduction. In other words, if you change the shape of a cell, you change the function of that shell, cell. Uh, and uh, that will be reflected basically on the whole individual as well. We'll talk about that just a little bit. Kind of interesting stuff to me. Okay, so if you want to treat somebody using an osteopathic treatment approach, we kind of expect as you go through first year, second year, third year, residency or whatever, you can understand there's only a certain number of patterns and problems that can be associated with an elbow joint or the spine. Spinal mechanics are very straightforward, a little hard to figure out in terms of palpating and make sure they work for you. But there's only so many patterns there. There's only 11 cranial strain patterns, common strain patterns, for example. There's only so many sacral patterns. Some of you will be very happy as you get into the evaluation of the sacrum. There's only so many patterns there. Uh, but if you understand those, then you can treat those. You have to overlay those, though, with a knowledge of the physical properties of material. Here the material, if you will, uh, would be such things as collagen and muscle, muscle tone, how they affect joints and structures, and even things like lymphatic return because of mechanical restraints. So overlaying these treatments with your properties of tissues, you recognize that the spine does not act just as a biomechanical uh, structure, it reflects function in terms of the innervation pathways that come from organs, reflect into the paraspinal muscles, so you can get a tight muscle someplace because you have an ulcer. And that place would be probably T6 and T7 on the left side because that's just a basic uh, knowledge of embryology that we'd be looking at. So th these seem to become quite important when you're trying to ferret out the problems associated with the biomechanical arena. And why do we do this? We do structural changes to make physiologic changes. One of the most exciting things, hopefully you can realize, you can change physiology with your hands. Wow, how cool is that? You can do things with your hands that drugs cannot do, for example. Uh, also, you want to have a goal in mind optimizing structural integrity and optimizing homeostatic function uh, for that particular individual. Now, microsystems are quite good. Uh, uh, how many are familiar with the notion of a myofascial release? That's where I put, yeah, very good. So with myofascial release, a direct myofascial release, what do you do? In the simplest form, you stretch tissues, okay? So there's a fellow named Stanley and others who looked at myofascial uh, release. They tried to get a, a, a uh, model in terms of cell physiology that might be able to exemplify that, and they found if they took fibroblasts, these are a little fibroblasts over here, and if you stretch them at the rate of 3% or 6% or 9%, guess what? What do you think fibroblasts do if you stimulate them? They make all these little structures here called fibrin, but they also make the lymphokines and the cytokines necessary for the healing process. You know, things like macrophage attractant factors and that type of thing to gobble up the degree and make things work in terms of the healing process. So they enhance healing, and that's really quite well done. Uh, in addition to measuring some of those things, they put defects on these plates where they st stretch them. They found those where they put this mechanical stretch, they healed faster than if they didn't stretch them. So you have this mechanical transduction. You're altering DNA activity for the betterment of your patient. The other thing that's interesting, other studies, Ingber and others, show that you can not only change the, uh, the uh, output, if you will, of populations of cells. If you start with, say, adult pleural potential cells, you can change the cells that they're, they're making. You can make cartilage cells, you can make bone cells, you can make muscle cells just by stretching. Can you think, anybody think of a drug you can do that with? I can't, there's none out there that I know of. So you can create this population of uh, chondrocytes, if you will, based on simical, sim simple mechanical stretch. Interestingly enough, even things like, in addition to cell line differentiation, tumor genesis is possible, and wound healing, of course, quite enhanced with your, with your uh, mechanical stretch. So those are just little excerpts from the biomechanical world. Uh, this is part of the study recently published to, by uh, Dr. Degenhardt and Noel. Anybody know Dr. Degenhardt? Yes, so he published this study. And you notice with this, if you're the young age group in the frail elderly, a lot of these were nursing home uh, uh, patients, if you will. Now, younger age group for this is 50. So 50 to 55, then 55 to 60, and that's how they broke them down in five-year increments. And with this, with the younger age uh, subgroup, you can change your length of stay for hospitalization uh, for the OMT group versus conventional care down to 2.9 days versus 4.0 days. I'll talk about financial responsibility in the era of uh, limited resources. This is very, very important. And, of course, they did better. You can also look at things such as respiratory failure. By the way, anyone who can see the little blue on the OMT, it's here, but you can hardly see it. 
So the, the blue is what we are looking at as far as a comparison group. If you look at this uh, slide and go to the uh, depths of your paper, you can change in hospital mortality. Mortality in the 75 age plus group uh, from 13% down to 2% with OMT. I mean, that's, to me that's stunning when I read that uh, uh, statistic. If you look at other things here across, across the bar graphs there, res respiratory failure, those types of things, very interesting to uh, look at that. If you use less antibiotics, what does that tell us about microbial, antimicrobial stewardship? You know, resistant strains are a big deal. So if you end up using less and more appropriate antibiotics, can you change that? And the answer is, yeah, you can. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting here, see the little orange one there? Not the purple, not the blue? That's just a light touch group. So the light touch group did better than conventional care group. And why was that? Maybe there's something healing about human interaction. I think so. That's what this data is showing us. Okay, um, within the realm of neurology then, we, we expect you to become very uh, versatile and familiar with the sympathetic and parasympathetic effects on organs and organ systems. But this is something kind of hot off the press, so to speak. We knew almost nothing about this, unless you went back to the 1800s, uh, in, uh, in the last a couple of years. If you have any textbook in anatomy on your, uh, on your sh shelf, electronic or otherwise, they say there are no lymphatics within the cranium completely false. No one could understand why the brain being so sensitive uh, could be cleansed of waste products and clearance of waste products based on the typical pathways we talk about in terms of cerebral spinal fluid. It can't happen. So this is one thing that they discovered. If you look at the graphic here, you see the little pink dots. Those are immune surveillance cells, the CD3 cells that are trafficking in those dural lymphatic si dural sinuses. And here you can see the tent and the falx uh, where you see the channels for lymphatic flow and uh, red, red dots which indicate your CD4s as well. So they have these lumens that are in there. This has immense uh, potential as far as osteopathic treatment in terms of enhancing lymphatic drainage through in, within the cranium, especially for those disease entities, the dementias, where there's an accumulation of protein, such as Alzheimer's disease, where that uh, beta amyloid is increased and the tau protein is increased. Uh, so if you can clear them better, maybe the patients will do better. Because the problem is not excessive production, the problem is decreased or delayed or inappropriate clearance, as the studies show. This is something else uh, that's been uh, when, when I first heard about this, I thought, wow, how cool is this? This, if you look at the top picture there, you have a fluorescent study showing these peri perivascular channels within the brain. So around the arterioles and the venules, you have a little channel where you get cerebral spinal fluid influx coming through there, and it goes through active and passive transport gradients and goes over to the ven ven venous system, the venules, and then the waste products go out for, for processing. If you look at this uh, MR of a diseased brain, you can see how it doesn't look so good. And you see little white spots there. They couldn't tell what a lot of the white spots were. A lot of those white spots are these exaggerated perilymphatic or perivascular channels, uh, which tells us they're just not getting enough release of the waste products that are accumulating. And that's where it seems to be the data uh, that's showing up. The fluid propulsion to this, by the way, is primarily through voluntary respiratory effort. You'll hear your professors talking about good breathing, diaphragm. Uh, probably more than you want to hear, but here's another example of how important that is because that promotes proper circulation of the cerebral spinal fluid, removal of waste products uh, because of this. Uh, also, th such things as vascular pulsation seem to propel it. Uh, things like the solute concentration, the water concentration makes a big difference. Third wave phenomena such as the cranial rhythmic impulse and the crowd pairing Meyer wave and those slow wave phenomena, no one's investigated that yet. But people doing the research, they go, yeah, that'd be cool to do because we don't know that yet. And I'd like to see that, that uh, research. That can be done. It can be done. Some of this can be done. Probably anybody that has a 3T magnet, by the way, for an, for an MRI study. OK, metabolism. Metabolism has to do with energy conservation. Uh, what is the burden of somatic dysfunction on each and every individual in here? The answer is, I don't know. Uh, and there's no studies done. I know it costs energy for you to maintain uh, those slouching postures that you have and those pain in your back because you're studying too much because of somatic dysfunction. What is the burden of somatic dysfunction? And the answer is we don't know. We do know things, uh, such as the things that are listed here. The oxygen cost of breathing is substantially increased in those people with COPD. Anybody know anybody with COPD? Anybody not know anybody with COPD? It's all over the place, exactly. Even you see it on TV trying to sell you stuff. Uh, so COPD, scoliosis, how many heart surgeries are done opening up the chest? So thoracoplasty, increase demand three times to four times on average. 
if you look at people that have a, a, a uh, uh, transfemoral amputation. Anybody know any uh, veterans from the wars? A lot of people coming back with amputees. Their energy demand for walking is substantially increased. So all of those things, to me, tell me that there is a tremendous disadvantage of carrying around somatic dysfunction. What is the burden of that? What's the cost of that? And the answer is we want to find out. This is very interesting, too. They talked about the, in the CME chronic pain, what 100 million people with chronic pain in the United States exceeds uh, cancer, it exceeds uh, cardiac disease, it exceeds diabetes by a lot. So chronic pain, there's energy demands based on chronic pain. Anybody know what epigenetic factors? If I take a pregnant woman and subject them to biological stress, whether they're emotional stress or physical stress or nutrition stress, guess what? Then, for some reason, these little methyl groups come and gum onto the uh, DNA and shut down certain areas or maybe turn on other areas, and they're virtually always detrimental. And that occurs if you're pregnant. They have shown that that pathway exists and continues not with you, but if you're carrying a girl child, your girl child will have that. And since your girl child will have ovaries, then the DNA in the baby's baby will be affected. So you have at least three generations of that. So what is the burden? What is the cost of that? I would maintain, uh, as an experience base, since I have treated a few uh, pregnant women and they do better, I think you can reverse this. I'd like to see a study that shows I can reverse epigenetic changes by simple OMP. And I'm convinced it can be done. Because if an adverse thing can cause this, I think a favorable thing can help reverse that thing. But I'd like to see the data. But that would be something to kind of think about. So what's the cost? What's the cost in terms of metabolic demand? How about behaviors? Most DOs probably spend more time with the behavioral arena or the world here than they realize. So behaviors are very important. But probably the more important thing is how many patients are everybody going to see in their lifetime? This will be on a slide later on, so you can't, you have to you know, kind of go fast forward to several slides if you want to know the answer. Each person in this room that goes into medical practice will probably have between 60,000 and 110,000 patient care encounters in their lifetime except for Dr. Strait, who probably has 300,000, busy guy that he is. Uh, but, and what, which means for your class, you have what? 100, uh, yeah, yeah, what's the math of 100,000 each of you times the number of your class? Think about the impact that you can make through that. So with this, probably the most important thing for you to make an impact is to work on yourself first, and then others will follow. So with this, we know selflessness and transcendence are those people who put uh, the lives and well-being of others above themselves is a marker, an indicator, or even a determinant of well-being. Resilience, your response to adversity, perhaps except for that anatomy test. I don't know if there's any cure for that. Um, um, character, your personal character makes a difference. Studies going back to the 70s, USC and other places show that you can improve the quality of life, length of life for people with advanced cancer or any stage of cancer. So this is a behavioral arena right in this that we're trying to talk about. Ill being, those people who are narcissistic, uh, put themselves self over all, uber, self uber all this type of thing, uh, those people, that's a determinant of ill being. There's studies all over the place that show these are negative things. These will have a emotional and or spiritual effect. There will be spiritual discord. Usual result of this is an emotional pain. An emotional pain is considered by many that really look at pain to be the most significant aspect uh, as opposed to physical pain. Now, you can talk about that and decide do you agree with that or not agree with that, it's okay with me, uh, but the point is the determinants of ill being kind of in this category, and those are perhaps things you'd like to work on uh, for yourself. Osteopath osteopathic medicine, of course, very much involved with uh, contact in terms of the haptic uh, communication. Haptic refers to the communication by sense of touch, and with that, I know there's a lot of sensory evaluation, sensory literacy uh, programs going on here dealing with static landmarks, and probably Dr. Dagenhardt or Dr. Snyder has shown you that data. Other data shows that if you're an inexperienced palpator, you can palpate motions in the range of about a millimeter. So if you put a dime on edge and you feel that ridge, that's about your level, that amount of motion, that's what the inexperienced palpator can feel. On the other hand, you can improve that 12 times or so by developing your palpatory skills, just as an example. And by this, you're not just palpating and experiencing such things as a superficial sense of touch and texture. Oh, this becomes very important when you're trying to determine, are those tissue texture changes related to that lung disease, that cardiac disease, or that kidney disease, or whatever it happens to be. Um, but they really become part of your database in order to understand uh, patients. Uh, one thing that's very much important for you is to understand normal. So when you're palpating your classmates, most of you are pretty normal. 
I'm making that assumption there. Um, that doesn't mean you don't have people that have ulcers in this room, don't have sports injuries, that type of thing, because you do. Uh, but basically, you have a database there that you're generating in your brain as far as the uh, database for normalcy. Very important for that. Professional touch can be diagnostic or therapeutic. It's a little different. We've gone from a, just a mechanical sensory process. Did you know that studies show that you can discern, people can discern emotions by palpation with about a 78% accuracy? So here's eight emotions that they looked at in terms of anger, fear, disgust, love, gratitude, sympathy, happiness, and sadness, accuracy rate of 78%. So if you can palpate that before and after, have you made a change with your osteopathic treatment techniques? I would hope so. And these are some of the things that you may, may do that. Most people, they go, oh, thanks, doc. Oh, I feel so much better. Well, what have you done as far as this emotional overlay that might be part or the cause of their particular problem? So tr proper touch strengthens relationships, a marker of closeness, and increases cooperation. What kind of system does that start talking about? What kind of brain physiology is going on with that? Anybody here, anybody here of serotonin? Oxytocin, maybe? Hasn't been measured, but I'm sure it's there because that's the phenomenon that you realize. Uh, research shows that the proper touch is the best way to comfort. And this is kind of part of it, too. I quote by uh, uh, one of our fellow physicians, uh, artistic subject and interpersonal nature of manipulative treatment is part of the importance of effectiveness of medical practice. A global statement. And I think it's a very important global statement for us to, to realize that. Now, as you go through those five arenas, remember we're not talking about arenas. We're talking about a person. So put this all together in some sort of patient-centered care paradigm for you in order to individualize this for each and every person. You can't just treat one arena and expect everything else to be fine. You have to kind of look at the totality of your patient as you go through. And again, these five models are a very good uh, way to kind of organize your thinking, especially later on. Anybody know this person? Go, yeah. Simply, they just call him Dr. Max. Max Gutenstein, namesake of your clinic building. Uh, I had the pleasure of knowing him. I have dis uh, he has disclosed to me, I can disclose his health information. He had really bad spinal stenosis. He had esophagitis. He couldn't hear since age 16. And with progressive hearing loss, he had hearing aids initially that were about as big as a truck that he wore around. Uh, they got smaller and smaller, but he didn't like them. He learned to read lips. So don't say anything in the back row if Dr. Max was uh, in the front, because he, he'd catch you at it, and he'd call you out on it, and he did. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of Dr. Max stories. He had this phenomenal... Uh, memory, he, if you came to him with your toughest medical problem, he goes, well, he had this tremor. Well, Dr. Lockwood, I think if you go to the New England Journal of Medicine, volume 27, 1843, you'll find the answer to your problem. But he just had that kind of memory. It was stunning. <laughs> he, he also had this ability to palpate. So even though he had this very coarse tremor, he, oh, oh, it's T2, must be heart. Oh, oh, five, six, must be, must be a stomach. Oh, oh, what's it? Oh, kidney. Oh, well, it's only on this side, not that side. Okay, right kidney. And he could do that to aid in his diagnostic ability. He also was a tremendous observer, so he could observe these types of things, and he would stun residents from time to time. He'd walk into a room with a person with a particular problem, and he'd kind of walk back out. He's going to come back back again, talk to residents as well. A person has a bleeding ulcer. What? How did you know that? Oh, well, you can smell the blood. So, and that was character. <laughs> and he was serious. And he'd you know, he, he do a scope, and there it would be. Or those days, a lot of it was barium studies back in his, his day. But the point is, he had this refined palpatory skill. He had great people skills. He was an overcomer from all these physical uh, ailments, if you will. Uh, and he was, again, another world changer. And you can be, too. It's not limited, just Dr. Max. So again, who among you will change the world? This is how you do it. See, we know how to do it. That's the cool thing. Employ those five models, work on yourself, very simple. With this, uh, from cognitive psychology, the most common uh, psychological method they use, basically, if you're faced with some sort of event, then you process that. And it's how you process that, how you store that, how you release that, it's important. So you start this internal debate, and then you insert truth. You don't lie to yourself. You go, uh, you know, you, Get honest with yourself. You recalibrate your thinking or your actions. And with that, you change the world by working on yourself. And as you get good at this, you don't need to be anxious about this. This is part of the normal growth process. So be anxious for nothing, as we say. So who's going to change the world? First, we can look at those uh, things where we know that sustainability, and this is something you find in the mission field. If I go to Guatemala one time, and that's it, guess what? I'd have done a good thing. But I ha do I have any sustainability? Probably not. Now, if I go back there once a year, once a month, 
I have sustainability. If you practice OMT one time, are you going to get it? Not so much. If you do this in increments, you get the sustainability, this enhanced skill set. So this is a very good life lesson here. But it takes work. Do you think so? It takes commitment. It takes persistence. It takes practice. And remember, we are the healing profession. This is an expectation. You're not being heroic by doing this. This is what's expected of you. Um, anybody know the code of the West? It says right here. Code of the West. Leave things better than when you got there. We got a fellow from Montana who tells us these types of things, these aphorisms from, from uh, cowboy life all the time. Great guy. Uh, but here, the code of the West. We have a responsibility to life, uh, and we have a responsibility to an improve life and its value. Anybody too young or too old in this room? Raise your hand. You are not too young. You are not too old. Even me, in my ancient days there, dirt was invented, and then here I am. You're not too young. You're not too old to serve others to model good uh, care, good, uh, good character, to equip others, if you will, to nurture, to teach, to open doors, to recognize the gifts of others, to support, and to serve others. Now, what motivates you? I don't know. You have to figure out what your own motivator is. Um, this is a motivator for our first uh, trip to Afghanistan. Anybody recognize her? Here's her name, back in National Geographic. One look at her, and then we had to go. So we went there and went four times. We spent our summer vacations in Afghanistan for four, four years ago. Pretty cool. And then we went, to, we went to Nepal for an extended period of time. And Nepal back to, again, relationship building going back to next year. Been to Haiti several times. And now with the Liberty University, we go to Guatemala on a regular basis and establishing really what we want to do as far as the sustained activity. That you would be motivated by something else. And you don't have to go outside Kirksville to serve. So serve others. Um, Sometimes not so pleasant. Grueling, hot, cold, wet, dry. It's a path less traveled. I encourage you to take that. It may be unglamorous. Uh, decisions and actions are always face consequences. They may be personal. They may be financial. Uh, they may be medical. They may be legal. They may be ethical. All those things are possible. But serve, and this is your, your results. You will have these uh, uh, results here. Uh, and this is something you can hardly put in terms of a verbalization, but I think you know uh, a bit of what I mean when I say peace and joy and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the types of rewards that you get for this. You don't necessarily get an uh, increase in your paycheck, at least I haven't, uh, but that's not the point. The point is you go out and serve and you will change the world. You have to get outside yourself to do this. So at the end of your day or your year or your life, your reputation, this is what appears on your CV, your curriculum vitae, a lot of that is determined by circumstances around you. Uh, it is learned in a, an hour. Now, that's a figurative hour, not a literal hour, but a figurative hour. In other words, a short-term type of uh, benefit for that. It's what you're supposed to be, it, what makes you rich or poor, and it's what men and women say about you. On the other hand, if you are looking at your obituary, your eulogy, your legacy, uh, your character, this is determined outside yourself. This is determined by truth. Uh, it's built in a lifetime. It's something that is who you are. Uh, it makes you joyful or wretched, depending on which path you decide to take. And it's what angels would say about you before the throne of God. This is kind of a paraphrase from someone else, of course. But that's uh, the big difference between a, a, uh, a reputation and your character, your achievements, and your, your legacy. So you have to ask your question, what's going to be your legacy? Where, what do you want your legacy to be? This will take some time to not just process information about this, but also to do this. This is a lifetime activity as far as your legacy, but it's not too early to start thinking about that now. So this will be a work in progress uh, for you, uh, and hopefully that progress will uh, not end until your last days. Some of us do not believe in retirement, so we're still trudging along. At some point, we may have less gainful in employment in our lifetime, but we have no plans of retiring, if you will. If you're retired, that's okay. I'm not being pejorative. I'm just saying that you have to be careful. I'm not in trouble here. But we are unfinished. We are just the start. We're starting today. So as we go forward uh, from today, then recognize, as the poet says, we have miles and miles to go before we, before we uh, sleep, and we are still unfinished, and we want to finish well. So I would encourage you all to finish well, and I think my time is up. Oh, thank you very much.